Hi, everybody. This is Eve Harrow on Rejuvenation for the Land of Israel Network. It is Saturday night, January 4th, 2020, eighth day of Tevet, 5780. I'm sitting here with Carolyn Glick. A few days ago, I was in touch with her because I've been wanting to interview her for a long time. And I said, like, you know, can we set it up Saturday night? And she said, great. And then she said, well, what are we going to talk about? And I said, I don't know, something will come up. <laughs> So yesterday, something came up big time. So first of all, Carolyn, Shavua Tov, and happy 2020. Shavua Tov, Shavua Tov. It's great to finally be able to sit down and talk with you about what, you know, just such few things that are going on. You know, it's so boring in our part of the world. Yes. Yeah, so great to be here. Yeah. I mean, we could have always talked about the winter weather that finally hit or the anti-Semitism that's all over America, or the which we might talk about anyway. But Qasem Soleimani, if I pronounce that right. What are you thinking? I'm thinking that this is just almost a seismic event. I mean, what people don't understand just how important Soleimani is to the entire Iranian empire building scheme, to the Iranian empire, to Iran's terror net nexus throughout the world. This man is the architect of so much mayhem and death and chaos and suffering in the Middle East and throughout the world. And, you know, now I saw that uh, Democrats in the United States, first of all, I think that they're out of their mind, and we have to talk about that separately. But, I mean, they're attacking Trump for ordering his, his, uh, his killing and referring to him as a foreign leader. And so I think it's really important for us to talk a little bit about you know, who he is and what he did and what the significance of his being killed by the U.S. military really is. So for those who don't know, I didn't even introduce you because it's just like, I just assume everybody knows who you are. Carolyn Glick, journalist, author, political commentator, yada, yada. Not, and for those who don't know, you were also embedded with the U.S. troops in Iraq, Iraq, 2003? 2003, back in the day, yeah, when we were all innocent. And I mean, not really innocent, because we in Israel had been going through this for so many years, but um, the Americans were were innocent. They didn't really understand what was happening in the Middle East. And they came in sort of willy-nilly and overthrew Saddam Hussein, thinking that if they got rid of him, that that was going to be great. And it would all, you know, change the world. But it did in a way that they hadn't foreseen, because they didn't understand the hornet's nest that they were getting into. Saddam Hussein was a uh, was a Sunni, and Iraq, much like Lebanon, is a multi-ethnic state. It has Sunnis and it has Shiites. It used to have Christians, a fairly large Christian minority. Now they're all gone as a result of the overthrow of Saddam. And they have Yazidis, who are also basically gone now because of ISIS that came later. But the point is that it's an end the Kurds. They used to have Jews too, but the Jews got out and right. did not willingly right. also centuries, uh, decades ago. Right. But there were almost no Jews there when, when the Americans invaded. But yes, there was a very large Jewish community in Basra and in Baghdad. The Jews were a third of the population of Basra in 1948. A very large, uh, I think it was the largest minority in uh in Baghdad as well. So there, yeah, I mean, and it was a, it was a Jewish community that had been in Iraq since the destruction of the first temple. But be that as it may, the point is that, uh, like the Assad's in Syria, the, the Ba'athists, it's this fascist party, and they were in charge of Iraq with Saddam Hussein and also with the Assad dynasty in Syria. And they were minorities. The Sunnis are the minority in in uh, in Iraq and the uh, Alawites are minorities in in uh, Syria, and because they were minorities, they sort of glued together the society by oppressing everybody equally, and they allowed other minorities to work with them because they trusted them. So, who are the majority in in Iraq? Are the are the Shiites? Now, um, Iranians are also Shiites. They're not Arabs, but they're Shiites. And so, when the Americans overthrew Saddam and said that they wanted to turn Iraq into a democracy. What they were saying was that they wanted to have open elections, popular elections, and that, and they didn't really know what that meant. And what that meant was that they were empowering the Shiite majority to take over Iraq, which from an American perspective sounds reasonable. But when you're dealing with multi-ethnic societies with no past tradition of democracy, what you're really doing is allowing Iran, which is also Shiite, to come in and subvert everything that you're trying to accomplish. So over the intervening many years since the American uh, 
uh, invasion in 2003, the Iranians used the, democ the, the democracy that the Americans were ushering in in order to subvert Iraq and in order to con con continue to destabilize it in the name of Shiite empowerment. And they brought, they formed all of these militias. They, by the way, they also in enabled, engendered, and, and directed Al Qaeda in Iraq. I mean, the, the heads of Al Qaeda in Iraq were actually imported into I Iraq from Iran. They all were headquarters in Iran, and then they came into Iraq. So throughout this period, when the Americans were fighting the insurgency, the insurgency was actually being directed by Iran. All of this is just a long way of saying something very, very plain, which is that although Iraq richly deserved to be invaded from the perspective of their destabilizing role, their hatred of the United States, their support for terrorism under Saddam Hussein, they weren't the real engine of the problem. In fact, even the 9-11 terrorists, a lot of them flew through Iran and they were trained by Hezbollah. And this is all in the 9-11 report that came out after the, after the attacks in 2001 that the Americans didn't understand. They said, oh, 15 Saudis was a Saudi operation. But no, it was actually very much the brainchild of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, which brings us to Soleimani. When you think about who it was who was the most destabilizing force in the Middle East in the last 20 years, it was Soleimani. It wasn't Saddam Hussein. It wasn't even the Taliban in Afghanistan, as strange as that may seem. It was the head of the Revolutionary Guard Forces, Quds Force. Because what is the Quds Force that he that he commanded. It is all of Iran's external operations outside of Iran. By the way, they are also involved in repressing all of the anti-regime protests inside of Iran. So the, the Reuters report came out last week or a week and a half ago that that the uh, regime killed 1,500 protesters in a, in a week. The people who did that were all directed by Soleimani. So basically all of the death inside of Iran was also directed by Soleimani. A lot of the repression is directed by him. He's the most powerful man in Iran, aside from Khamenei, who is the supreme leader, meaning the dictator of Iran. And his number two guy is Soleimani. But Soleimani, from our perspective, as Israelis, as anybody who lives outside of Iran, uh, was the most important Iranian because he was the one who ha is in charge of Hezbollah, not only Hezbollah in Lebanon, but Hezbollah all over the world, all of their operatives in Europe that commit terrorist attacks in places like Burgas, uh, Bulgaria, where they killed Israeli tourists a few years ago, all of their operations in Germany, all of their operations in France, all of their operations in England. They're all directed by Qasem Soleimani. In Latin America, all of the Hezbollah presence in, in Latin America, and there's an enormous amount in Brazil, in Venezuela, most importantly, in Nicaragua, in Bolivia. All of that is directed by Qasem Soleimani. The operation that was in 2000, and, I think 2004, they were planning on <clears throat> assassinating the Saudi ambassador in Washington. It was the El Quds force had made a deal with one of the, Rus the Mexican drug cartels to carry out an explosive attack on Cafe Milano in Georgetown because that's where the, to kill the Saudi Arabia ambassador while he was d dining there. And that was also Qasem Soleimani. So all of the international terrorism of Iran was directed by Qasem Soleimani. And then the other thing from a regional perspective that he directed was the war in Syria. Iran, when the Syrians started rising up against Bashar al-Assad, in 2011 because of uh, the economic devastation, the ecological devastation of Syria that caused the destruction of agriculture in Syria, mass urbanization, internal refugee crisis, water shortages inside of Syria. They started rising up as part of the Arab Spring. The person who was most responsible for the war that followed those protests was Qasem Soleimani because he, he was the one that was directing all of the operations, the mass death, the chemical weapons attacks, all of the attacks against the Syrians who were rising up against the Assad regime in order to maintain Assad because Assad is his puppet. And so the whole war that displaced 10 million people outside of Syria caused massive dislocation inside of Europe was responsible for all of the terrorism inside of Europe that we saw in 2015, 2016, and so on and so forth. That's all his handiwork. There's a, all a result of what he did in, in Syria. Not only in Syria, in Iraq, you see 
500 protesters have been killed by by the Shiite proxy militias, by the Shiite militias inside of Iraq since they started anti-Iranian protests in Iraq in, in October. All of those protesters were killed at the behest of Qasem Soleimani. So just in the last two months, he's killed 500 Iraqis who have been rising up against against uh, Iran and him. And so this is the whole Iranian operation in Yemen is directed where, where they use the Houthis which is sort of a Shiite uh, tribe inside of Yemen that have been taking over the country and securing the Bab al-Mandab, which is a major strategic waterway um, that together with the Straits of Hormuz give Iran basic control over all of the oil products transiting the from Saudi Arabia to world oil markets. That's all Qasem Soleimani. So the entire Iranian empire building project that extends to Yemen through Iraq through Syria through Lebanon that's all Qasem Soleimani and this man is now dead he, i mean he had no replacement and i don't know you know what's going to happen but this his killing but and the fact that the americans did it and did it publicly and took responsibility for it is like the kind of humiliation of the iranian regime in the middle of a domestic insurrection of a huge protest movement that they quelled by, you know, just spilling rivers of blood of Iranians just last month or in late, in late November. Now we're in early January. I mean, this is, this is unbelievable. The implications of strategic implications, the human implication, the humanitarian implications of this monster now being dead are just almost impossible to get your arms around. So there's a few things. One of them is, if this guy has been really the head of such an evil snake for a long time, you have to ask, what took so long to some degree, right? We had eight years of Obama, so it's not like they thought this guy was Mother Teresa at any point. So that's one question. And the other point that you made, which I think is incredibly important for Western audiences, is the humiliation, all right? Because we here who live in the Middle East and as a matter of fact, Dr. Harold Rode, who's an expert on this, the shame, the honor, the idea of humiliation in the Middle East happens to be in my house right now also at another meeting, um, is not, is, is a huge part of why they're going to have to respond because, and it's also a reason why Israel is never going to be able to have peace treaties with other neighbors because we've won wars against them and humiliated them. That's not undone by signing a piece of paper. And I don't think that Westerners understand that enough, that idea of, of if you're humiliated, you have to lash back. So um, so the first question you asked is, why did it take so long? And so, first of all, the Bush administration, apparently I saw it was reported yesterday um, that they had had an opportunity to kill him in 2004 and they decided not to. And the Bush administration is really sort of an interesting thing because they made, the president made after the invasion of Iraq, a strategic decision, which was a huge mistake to limit all of the U.S. operations to Iraq. And it was insane. It was such a stupid thing to do. And it really caused the war in Iraq to be something that was both unwinnable and also not worth a price because it was entirely directed from Iran. It was an Iranian war against the United States that was being fought against U.S. forces in Iraq. All of the, all of the militias that were fighting the United States were being armed and trained and directed from Iran by the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps by by Soleimani, and you know others. But he was the epicenter of the of the insurgency in Iraq, and the same is true with the Sunnis. And Karl Rove made this statement, like right after the invasion, said, "We're done." invading countries. And because Rumsfeld, there were all of these reports at the WMD that the United States presumably went into, you know, purportedly. Weapons of mass destruction. Weapons of mass destructions went into Iraq mm -hmm. because of that they were all going to Syria, which was true, by the way, and, and also being buried. I mean, why is it that ISIS was able to use chemical weapons after they took over Mosul in 2014? Because mm -hmm. the reports were true. They were being buried and hidden in Iraq and also in Syria. A lot of those weapons were used against civilians inside of Syria by the regime, by the Iranian forces that were assisting Assad. They knew where all of it was because they were directing the evacuation of the weapons of mass destruction from Iran, from Iraq in 2003. 
So Karlov said, we're done. And this was after Rumsfeld had said, who was the defense secretary at the time, that the United States was going to go in hot pursuit into Syria. And the, and Cal, Colin Powell, who was secretary of state, responded to that by flying to Damascus and representing Assad as a man of peace. So it was like this this reaction and this counter-reaction. They said, no more wars. But the minute that you have a war being fought against you, in a way it's like Vietnam, where the Soviets were using... Cambodia as a, uh, and of course, North Vietnam as a uh, means to transit fighters and everything to the South, and then, of course, to invade South Vietnam. And when the uh, Nixon administration made a decision that they weren't going to go into Cambodia, that they weren't going to go into Laos, that they weren't going to go into North Vietnam, they basically gave control over the entire, over the entire um, map to the Russians. And that was when the Americans lost. And so when the Bush administration repeated that mistake in 2003, and they said they weren't going to go after the Iranians, and they weren't going to go after the Syrians, which were the engines of the war being fought against the U.S. forces, they were saying, we're going to lose this war. So it was at that moment that they should have just picked up the 3rd Infantry Division, the 4th Infantry Division, and the Marine Corps, and taken them home. Because if you don't want to fight the war that's being fought against you, then you're going to lose the war that's being fought against you. And that's really what ended up happening. And that was Bush. And with Obama, what happened was that he changed his strategy completely. He said, all right, we're going to realign the United States in the Middle East away from our traditional allies, the Sunnis and the Israelis, and we're going to realign America towards Iran. That was what the whole nuclear deal was about. It wasn't about nuclear non-proliferation because they were giving Iran the bomb. And they said within 10 years they're going to have an arsenal, and that's fine with us. They they enabled the Iranians to build a nuclear arsenal. That was what the JCPOA did. That was why so many people were so viciously opposed to it, because anybody who truly understands what Iran is understands that the minute that these people get a bomb, there's going to be a nuclear war. And if you're anti-nuclear, And you have to do everything in your power to prevent them from getting a nuclear bomb. But that wasn't what Obama was about. He was about being anti-American and anti-Israel and anti-Sunni. He was for the Muslim Brotherhood, which is why he supported the overthrow of America's closest Arab ally, Hosni Mubarak, in uh, in Egypt, even though he knew that there was only one force that could take over Egypt, which was the Muslim Brotherhood, which they did in 2013. And, And so he... And he was for Iran, which is why he made the deal with them that gave them $150 billion in sanctions relief. He gave them $450 million in cash. And he didn't touch Suleimani. <clears throat> no, it's not just that he didn't touch Suleimani. The GC, JCPOA stipulates that seven years after the conclusion of the agreement, which depending on how you look at it can either be 2021 or 2022, because if it was the initial... It was initialized in 2014, and then the extended agreement was concluded in, in July of 2015, but that all sanctions against Soleimani were going to be canceled. So that the agreement was actually with Soleimani, and it was for his benefit personally. So it, it empowered Soleimani both monetarily and politically because it legitimized everything he was doing in Syria. The Has Iran- Obama had a reaction to the to the taking out of Soleimani? You know, Shabbat just ended here yeah. in Israel, so I haven't been paying attention. But, you know, all of his surrogates have been o- all over Twitter since it came on. I mean, you know, on Friday morning in Israel time, um, uh, saying how horrible it is. Ben Rhodes, Samantha Power, all of them, they're, they're, it's pathological. I mean, how could they possibly bemoan the assassination of, of the most prolific killer that was alive until yesterday on on Earth, and yet they they are, and that just shows how deeply um, uh, rotten, rotten, evil, horrific, anti-American. Yeah, anti-American, anti-Semitic, pro-Iranian, pro not even pro-Iranian, because of course you have millions of Iranians who are praying for the overthrow of their regime. Pro-Iranian. Uh, totalitarianism or Islamic totalitarianism, whether it's of the Muslim Brotherhood variety or of the Iranian vi- variety, the Obama administration truly was how totally destructive they were to American society and to America's strategic interests and, of course, to America's allies, which is why, you know, it, it you know, that was the other remarkable thing. So, you know, about the, the question of humiliation that you asked about, I think it's really important to look at this from their perspective, 
Because, you know, we always feel bad. Like, you know, if somebody attacks you and then you hit them really hard in front of all the pretty girls in class. And mm-hmm. in the end, you kind of feel embarrassed. I shouldn't have done that. I hurt him too bad. You know, now he's going to hate me for whatever. But that's not how our enemies see it. Because we'd like to be gallant in victory or with, uh, what did Lincoln say in the second uh, inaugural with, uh, oh, I'm going to ruin his thing. But it was, it, the basic idea was that you're you're not going to hate anybody unnecessarily, that you with charity for all is how he ended that beautiful clause, which I don't want to mangle. So the idea was that you want to be gallant in victory. You don't want to be cruel. Be gracious as the winner. Exactly. Be gracious as the winner. And then, and so we look at it and we say, we don't want them to be humiliated because then they'll be mad at us. But no, that's not true. The, the thing that keeps the peace between Israel and its allies is that they were humiliated, not that they were treated well, because it's the humiliation that deters them. It's what makes them not fight. So that if you're a genocidal Iranian theocrat who believes in the that the coming of the Messiah is going to happen any day, and that that's going to usher in an Armageddon where you're going to annihilate the Jewish state, annihilate the United States of America, um, and and introduce a global theocracy under the banner of the Iranian theocracy, then if you're humiliated, it's like they're killing your God. And you can't get back a God that's dead. But that doesn't make them want to fight harder to on, to bring honor and take shame away from what just happened? Yes and no, because their their entire theology was exposed as, as as a lie. And so what you also have is a lot of revisitation of belief systems by its adherents. So that, that's that's not true. I mean, if you think about it from the perspective of uh, of of a believer, so some of them are going to believe till the bitter end, you know, like some of the people who were in the Soviet gulag were drawing pictures of Stalin on the walls of their cells, you know, because they still believed in him. They still believed that he was the big brother and he he was going to save them, even though he was the reason they were in Siberia and starving to death. But they still believe. So, that yeah, you'll have people like that, but you'll also have a lot of people who wake up from the delusion and walk away. And in fact, most people are going to do that because most people aren't the true believers. Most people are the people who go with the winners. And so when you humiliate them like this, when you kill Suleimani and you brag about it, just like when, you know, Donald Trump killed Baghdadi and talked on and on and on about the beautiful dog who killed him, he humiliated Baghdadi and humiliated his followers. They were embarrassed. They were ashamed because he humiliated them. And then he brought the dog to the White House. I mean, that was one of the most powerful psychological operations the Americans have done since 9-11 because he finally gets it that you have to humiliate them. And so by killing Suleimani, what you're saying, among other things, not just a theological issue, it's also the winner-loser issue. You know, uh, uh, Obama didn't want to win. You know, he was so embarrassed that they killed Osama bin Laden. And, you know, and he kept going on about how he had like a a, a full Islamic uh, funeral ceremony. Like anybody cares, you know, why would he get one? Like, that's stupid. Why didn't you wrap his body in pig skin and throw him in a dumpster? You know, that's what he deserved. Right. But no. And, and that would have been a, a really smart thing to do psychologically. In fact, show him in a pig skin being thrown into a dumpster. That would have been really great, but, you know, whatever. Obama didn't do that. And Trump is the kind of person who would do that. And it's not just from a theor- theological perspective that it's important. It's from a psychological perspective because whose side do you want to be on? Whose side do you want to be on? You want to be on the side of the winners, not on the side of the losers. The lame losers were killed by a dog, a beautiful dog. When you're whole religious system is based on the idea that a dog is unclean and disgusting. It's amazing. You feel like a loser. Who wants to continue fighting for a bunch of losers? Who wants to be identified with losers? The answer is not them. They want to be with a side that's winning. So the likelihood of desertion just increased tremendously among the Shia forces, among the people who are in the Revolutionary Guard Corps. And not just that, 
the the prospect now of the United States and other foreign intelligence agencies being able to recruit spies within the uh, uh, the, the, the Revolutionary Guard Corps that was commanded by Soleimani increased dramatically now because they want to be with the winners. If they think that their side is about to lose, and plus you have hundreds of thousands of Iranians who have, were on the street just a couple weeks ago calling for the overthrow of the regime until they were violently put down by Khamenei, you know, you're, you're talking about a recipe for the new complete destabilization of the Iranian regime, which is fantastic. Again, you know, <clears throat> one of the things that we've forgotten in our, you know, morally um, relative uh, age that we're living in, postmodern age, is that we forget that there is a distinction between good and evil. And we forget that there's a reason why you have to win wars and that it's in the service of morality. It's in the service of goodness because we are the good guys. You know, you don't go around killing people who protest against you. You know, you don't massacre children in front of their parents to scare their parents into submission or children massacre their mothers in front of them to scare them into submission. You don't do things like that. But in Iran, they do because they're evil. And we want to do everything that we can to destabilize and overthrow this regime because they're our enemy. They're the enemy of the Iranian people. They're the enemy of the Jewish people. They're the enemy of the American people. They're the enemy of everybody. They're Saudis, of everybody who wants to live their way and not the Iranian theocrats' way. And they're brutal. They're seeking and, you know, about to complete a nuclear weapons program. They have cruise missiles that they used, guided missiles that they used to destroy half of Saudi's uh, oil infrastructure in September. They have uh, agents all over the world who have been trained to kill on a massive scale. Um, and they've used those skills in the past. We saw in the AMIA bombing in, in 93, uh, you know, the largest massacre of, of, of Jews since the Holocaust, uh, you know, um, in Argentina, in Argentina, in Buenos Aires, the Jewish Community uh, Center, you know, you you you've seen their handiwork. All 241 Marines who were killed by these people in 1983 in Beirut, and so on and so forth. So, as Israelis who are a little wary of Hezbollah that are sitting with lots of missiles in southern Lebanon, another Iranian proxy, you think that that might have an effect on what Hezbollah is thinking as well? I think Hezbollah is terrified. And I think, you know, I was saying before before uh, Shabbat yesterday, I posted on my Facebook page a uh, picture of uh, Nasrallah. I was crying, you know. <laughs> Hassan Nasrallah, the secretary general of Hezbollah, he's <coughs> Suleimani's, you know, uh, Lebanese uh, sycophant. He's his proxy. He's his sycophant. He, he, he took all of his orders from Suleimani. His Suleimani was essentially the commander of Hezbollah, and I and I wrote on top of it that you know the headline next, mm -hmm. you know, so because the Iranians announced three days of mourning for Suleimani. Fantastic. Let's take advantage of them. Let's kill Nasrallah. Why is he still alive? I mean, you know, the thing is, is that you you get a um, backwind to fight these people when these things happen. They're scared. The psychological impact of losing your commander is enormous. It's enormous. Do you think it's good that America is taking this on itself and all the credit? Because it would seem to me, just from the little that I know, that it maybe Israeli intelligence, maybe even other intelligence, let's say from England, must have had some help here in the Middle East, you know, helping the United States to a lot of intelligence went into that. But America's right now taking all the credit, all the blame, all the whatever you want on its own. And Israel is staying very quiet. What do you think about that? I think it's fantastic. I think it's about time that somebody take credit for things. You know, Israel uh, destroyed the Syrian nuclear reactor reactor in uh, in 2007 and Condoleezza Rice, who was uh, was a strategic uh, thinker, you know, with the brain of a mushroom. I mean, she was so wrong about everything that she said and did. She just was horrible. And she gave terrible advice to George Bush, who was a terrible secretary of state, a terrible national security advisor. And she ordered Israel after the strike. First of all, she opposed it. She wanted to 
talk about it at the New United Nations Security Council, which would have enabled the Syrians, you know, to develop a bomb in six months of negotiations, just like we saw with North Korea, and just like we're seeing with with Iran under the under the Iranian nuclear the, under the nuclear deal that they concluded with Obama. So that would have been a disaster. And everyone yelled at Menachem Begin also Syrac in 1981. Right. So exactly. And then they came back and they and they licked his boots for having saved them and enabled essentially everything that came afterwards for better or for worse. Mm -hmm. But uh, um, so Condoleezza Rice ordered uh, then Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Omer to keep to keep mum about it. Not to say he didn't want to embarrass Bashar al-Assad. You know, that's that sort of that's lunatic because you want to be able to say we're better than you are. We're stronger than you are. We're not afraid of you. We're willing to 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 stare you down. We're going to take you down because you want to empower the people inside of those countries who oppose their regime to oppose it, to not. Be scared because, I mean, that was what happened in, in the Green Revolution when millions of Iranians came out into the streets in 2009 after uh, the regime stole the elections from the winners and they gave it back to Mahmoud Ahmadinejad even though he won like 20% of the vote. And so the people came out. They said our votes matter. And there you had millions of people in the streets and then, you know, and then the regime started killing them all. And they were screaming into, the, into their um, cell phones and posting online, Obama, whose side are you on? Because Obama was on the side of Ali Khamenei and the people who were killing them. That was what he, he wanted. He didn't want that regime to be overthrown. He wanted to make peace with that regime. He wanted that regime to replace Israel as the United States' chief ally in the Middle East because he thinks that you know they're better than America. It's just like he ran around apologizing to everybody for America being good for eight years. That was who he was. And here you're seeing Secretary of State Pompeo, you're seeing President Trump, you're seeing, you know, uh, 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 other very important Americans, Brian Hook, uh, uh, Secretary Esper, saying, we stand with the Iranian people. We believe in the future of Iran. We believe in you. But we understand that this regime is evil. So when you take responsibility for for doing something that harms a regime that is oppressing its own people and the future of Iran def depends on them standing up and being counted against these overlords who are killing them and their children. I mean, that's a very important thing. Israel, you know, we're not in a position to that. And the Americans did learn after Iraq that they don't understand anything about the Middle East. You know, they don't. I mean, they had no idea what they were doing when they went into Iraq. I say this somebody who loved the soldiers who, who I went into Iraq with. I mean, I was in continuous combat with these guys. They were wonderful people, the best Americans I ever met in my life, and I, I mean it. And, and, and a lot of them died because of misguided of, policy? A lot of them died. A lot of them died, and a lot of them came back, you know, uh, with uh, traumatized by what they had gone through, and they are the best of the best. And there are the people who least deserved this. They were just served by a government that never bothered to figure out what it was doing before it did it. You don't just send people willy-nilly into to a foreign land that you don't understand and tell them to take it over. You, they didn't know what they were doing. But that's a completely different issue. The point is just that the people who do understand what's happening are the people who live there. And we know that this regime is evil for what it does outside of Iran. They know what it's doing is evil from the way that they experience it every day inside of Iran. I don't know if that, you know, if God willing, this regime is is overthrown. I don't know who the people are going to take over are, and I don't know whether they're going to be any better, but they'll be weaker. Mm -hmm. And so we have an interest in them coming in and doing the best they can, and then you can help them. You don't want to choose sides too much because you don't understand enough about them. But... You know, get rid of one problem. You can deal with the next one when it comes up. In the meantime, this regime has been at war with the United States for 41 years. You know, since they took over the embassy in, in November of 1979 and took these Americans who were there as diplomats. You know, and that was the other thing in a way, which I thought was very important and that the American media in its corrupted state has been hiding. Suleimani directed the invasion of the U.S. Embassy compound 
in Iraq last week. That was his brainchild. He has been directing the entire operation of the Iraq, of the Iraqi government and of the Shiite militias inside of Iraq since the beginning of the protests in October. And this was his decision to have the militia go in and try to take down the embassy last week. This was an operation that, for people who have looked at the footage or remember the uh, takeover of the U.S. Embassy in Tehran in 1979, it looks very familiar because it's the same operation. And the, and the corrupted New York Times and CNN that referred to them as mourners and as protesters are, are an obscenity. They're an embarrassment to the, to, to the profession of journalism that they could dare to do that. These people were even in uniform. They, were even, you know, they weren't even trying to hide what they were doing. It was the New York Times that was trying to hide who they were, which is just such a miscarriage of everything that they're supposed to stand for. But again, that's another issue. The point is that they conducted a military operation against the United States whose goal was the overthrow the destruction of perhaps the taking captive of U.S. diplomatic personnel inside of the U.S. Embassy, which was an act of war against the United States, you know, as, as much as the, over, the, the takeover of the U.S. Embassy in Tehran in 1979 was. As the killing of the ambassador in Libya, although that went uh, on, you know, most people don't even remember that anymore. The, yeah, and Benghazi, and also, you know, and yes, so you've had repeated attacks on U.S. embassies and in Nairobi and in, and in Tanzania, in 1998, you've had repeated attacks on U.S. diplomatic compounds since 1979, and this is the first time that the United States competently responded to that sort of attack on their sovereignty. And so this was a very important, just if, I mean, and that's the thing, is that this operation was so important on so many different levels. It accomplished so many goals at the same time. It was, it was truly beautiful. It was justice, well served against an evil, evil man who is extraordinarily dangerous to all humanity. And the fact that anybody is criticizing it is crazy. The fact that the Democratic Party is criticizing it as the party. I mean, I saw Nancy Pelosi attacked it. You have, you have all of these, you know, and it just shows that the anti-Semites, the anti-Americans have taken over the Democratic Party. They have corporatized the Democratic Party. It has become an anti-American party. It has become an anti-Semitic party. And, and it's terrifying that this has happened. But their responses to the killing of one of the most dangerous men on the face of the planet, one of the greatest and gravest enemies to the United States, to the Saudi Arabian government, to, to Israel, to all good people in the region and in the world, and of course to the Iranian people first and foremost, that they could mourn his death or bemoan the killing of this man is really a testament to how low they have fallen and how dangerous they have become. And so I think you know, that's another sort of kind of bright, light that has been shining. Maybe a wake-up call to the Americans. <clears throat> I don't know. I mean, the people who are in, uh, in that boat are there, you know, and I don't know. I don't know. What the people who hate Trump, they hate Trump. There's just no, there's no talking them out of it. Well, you know, there are also these sort of psychotic, uh, never Trump Republicans, you know, that you see. But I, 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 maybe one or two of them will wake up. I doubt it because they're now, you know, they're, they're very happy at MSNBC and CNN. I don't, I don't know. I mean, I saw... When he said that uh, Jake Tapper from CNN, who used to be, you know, semi reasonable, he's completely out of his mind. He he interviewed uh, Trita Parsi, who is an Iranian regime lobbyist in Washington, um, defending Soleimani, and he never attacked him for it. Apparently, it was quite a quite an easy, friendly interview with this man who has been defending these mass murderers who are nuclear proliferators who run the largest terror operation mankind has ever seen and that is actively building an empire swallowing up Iraq, Yemen, Syria, and Lebanon at the cost of millions of lives. Where do you see Russia in all this? Look, Russia has been uh, an ally of Iran. You know, Russia is an ally of Iran and you know, so are they going to feel like they have to now step up and do something? No, I don't think that they're going to do anything for Iran. I think 
On the other hand, that again, you know, that's the whole concept of winning. The psychological impact of harming an enemy is that he's weakened. And that's good because then he's less attractive to possible allies because you don't want to go with the guy who's going to lose. People choose. Why is it that Israel is doing so well diplomatically? Uh, why is it that over the past decade, Israel has developed such good and sort of unprecedented relations with all of these countries that never never thought about having serious relations with us? It's because our economy is is doing great. It's because we've developed all of these technologies that people want. Mm -hmm. It's because we're winning. It's because, you know, from a security perspective, we seem to be getting our house in order. You know, obviously, from our perspective, it's it's a mixed bag. But from the outside looking in, it looks like we've got our stuff together. Right. And, you know, with, with selling natural gas now to Cyprus and to Greece and connecting ourselves and with Europe Egypt. via the Mediterranean and, and to Egypt and to Jordan. I mean, we're becoming energy independent. Israel, Israel is becoming energy independent that like we used to just. I mean, what were our exports? When I was growing up in America, we used to sell towels. You know what I mean? Like, oranges. Yeah, yeah, and oranges. I mean, it, it, like Israel was nothing. It was nothing. And now everything is coming here. Everybody's coming here. You know, we're building cars, you know, because we're building the computers that run the cars. You know, I mean, it's all all, all of the technologies here. You, you go to Tel Aviv and you see the research headquarters of Ford. You know, I mean, they're like, what? I don't think there's one major company in the world that doesn't have some kind of R&D here now. It's amazing. So you, you see all of these people coming to us. Be, why? It's because we're perceived as a winner. We're perceived as a strong, stable economy and military that, again, has its stuff together. People want to be with people who they perceive and with countries that they perceive as doing well, as winning. They don't want to be with losers. How many people are lining up? to do business with Venezuela, even though they have the largest proven reserves, you know, like outside of the outside of the Arabian Peninsula and of, of oil. I mean, the, it would seem like, yeah, in spite of everything, because they're a failed state. That's why nobody wants to have anything to do with Venezuela because they understand that it's just sinking money into a hole. And so nobody's going to go to Venezuela. And so, you know, it, where do you want to go to make your investments? People want to go to Egypt. No, they're afraid to go to Egypt. Mm -hmm. Because the Muslim Brotherhood might take over tomorrow, you know, and so he's also been very quiet. He's got so many internal problems. I think they add a million people a year to their population. They have ninety three, ninety four million people that they have enough reserves to feed for maybe the next three months. I mean, Egypt, which used to be the you know Arab state and the superpower on that level here in the Middle East, and now. It's like a sidebar. It's really the, the silence is deafening coming out of Egypt. But, but getting back to Russia, because, you, you know, we spoke about empire building, and that's obviously where Iran's going. So you've got Russia, which is on that path as well. And you also have Turkey. And these are kind of Erdogan is, I don't know, is he like a little loose cannon here? I mean, where do you see these two countries coming into the picture now in the next few days? Look, in the next few days, I don't know, but Erdogan is a strategic threat to Israel, and it's a strategic threat to the United States, and he is an enemy, and he's an enemy that's also an ally of NATO, a NATO member, mm -hmm. and it's a problem because if you look at where Turkey is on the map, I'm just, you know, sometimes I do this. I just stare at the map of the world for a while and to really, because a lot of times, I mean, even I see with my articles that, you know, I, tr I tell my editors, you have to put a map in. And then they don't. You know, they want to put an illustration and they don't put a map. And, and a lot of this stuff you can't understand unless you look at the geography. You have to understand where people are. What are they involved in? What, what are they in charge of? What water do they border or not border? You know, and when you look at Turkey on the map, you see, well, maybe you could do something with Georgia. Maybe you could do something with Azerbaijan and and like get around Turkey this way or that way. But Turkey is just this big thing. It traverses Europe and Asia. And it it's you don't want to give it to Russia. And yet uh, you, you can't really lose Turkey. So you can kind of understand why the U.S. military, in spite of everything, won't take its nuclear arsenal outside of Incirlik Air Base, why it won't reduce its its uh, its dependence on Incirlik for its air operations in, in Central Asia and in the Middle East, because they don't want to get rid of it. It's you can't you can't replace geography. 
So then the question is, well, what do you do about Erdogan? And the answer is, you stop empowering him. You know, I mean, that's the problem. And that is something that I think that Trump is doing wrong. You know, obviously, I don't know everything that's going on, but I mean, he keeps publicly praising Erdogan. And that's a really big mistake. I mean, one of the, one of the, and, and you know, Harold Road, for instance, is somebody who could speak to this better than I. But I, if I'm not mistaken, you know, they had uh, Pastor Brunson that was an American evangelical pastor living in, in, in Turkey for about 20 years and, and uh, mission, missionizing in, in, uh, in uh, Turkey. He had a church, and he was arrested after the attempted fa- at the failed coup against Erdogan in, in 2016. And he was essentially being held hostage because he didn't do anything. I mean, it's just this pastor in some, you know, bumble town, you know, anywhere, it, whatever. And, and he, had, he was a nobody, but he was an American, and they were holding him hostage. And it was fairly clear that he was a hostage. So last year, Trump started putting sanctions on Turkey until Pastor Brunson was let out because he has a very large evangelical constituency and they brought it to his notice. And so we did it. And he was publicly threatening Erdogan. And it was around that time that Erdogan started losing elections. So he lost, for instance, the election to the mayor of Istanbul, which is where he got his political start. And they're supposed to be like a focal point of of the of his party of Islamism in 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 uh in Turkey, and yet he lost, and then he tried to steal the election. He canceled the results of the election. There was a re-election, and he lost even worse, his candidate, his party. And I would say, again, the Turks aren't stupid. You know, they understand now what's happening with Erdogan. A lot of them really support him very much because they are Islamist. They're Islamic extremists. But a lot of them don't. And, you know, it's gotten to the point with Erdogan, especially with him buying the uh, Russian uh, uh, anti-ballistic missile uh, uh, S-400 system, which is not, as they say, interoperable with NATO uh, F-35. So the Americans stopped delivery of the F-35s. Turkey ordered 100 of them last year. Um, you know, you want to not be his friend. But then after Brunson was released, I mean, I'm sure because of the Pentagon that doesn't want to get rid of Inserlik, you know, that doesn't, that is looking at the map saying we can't lose Turkey. Don't look for the quick fix. Okay, don't leave Inserlik. All right, I would get rid of, I would take some of those nuclear weapons out of Inserlik, but I've been saying that for years. Nobody's listening to me. You know, whatever. Like, do whatever you want. But the way to maintain Inserlik is not to empower the guy who's endangering Inserlik. It's to not strengthen him. It's to recognize that he is an enemy of the United States, that what he stands for and what he is transforming Turkey into is bad for America. And that means, fine, don't get rid of your real estate. Keep your real estate. Nobody's telling you to stop. But why do you have to be so nice to the guy? Why do you have to empower the guy? Don't empower him. Just by not empowering him, by pointing out when he's holding an American pastor hostage and and putting sanctions on him, he's already losing steam inside of his own country. Let the people of Turkey take care of their Erdogan problem. He's their problem. They want to be treated well in the world. They want people to invest in the Turkish economy. Then they have an interest in weakening him and not allowing him to be president for life. They have an interest. Let them act on their interest. Don't don't you don't have to do everything. America doesn't have to a nation build, but one thing it definitely shouldn't be doing is empowering the people or harming it. And so that's you know, that's really what how I view Turkey and how I view everything. You know, fine, don't let the Iranians take care of the regime. Give them the tools to take care of the regime. Don't throw in the fourth infantry division to take care of the regime in Iran. But if Iran has nuclear installations that have to be taken out, take them out. Just like you take out Soleimani. You know, there are things that are your problem. Nuclear installations in Iran are a problem for the entire world. The Iranian, the existence of the regime itself, that's the Iranian people's problem. 1,500 of them were killed in two weeks by these people. And when you talk about an Iranian regime where women have 1.9 children per, ba- per, per family, you know, they're not interested in sacrificing their children. There is no such thing as cannon fodder in a country that's below replacement level fertility rates. So, again, what are you thinking about Putin? Are there any pressure points that the United States can put there? Because, I mean, 
Is Russia a democracy? Can the Russians take care of Putin? Do they even want to? Because I was in St. Petersburg in June talking to people. Yeah, I mean, they're not very happy there. There's kind of a veneer and they're still not where they want to be. But do they see a replacement for him? Do they like what he's doing by getting bigger and bigger on the world stage? No, but I think part of the problem there is that the United States doesn't have a lot of leverage with Russia anymore because the Chinese have sort of taken over the Russian economy, which is a completely different issue, and we don't have time to talk about it today. But, you know, you have to look realistically at what you can do, and you have to look realistically at the threats that you can handle and the ones that you're going to have to leave for another day. You know, that means that you try to neutralize them as much as possible, but you're not going to take them out today. And so, like, for instance, uh, my friend David Goldman, who's really an expert on the uh, on the trade war between the Chinese and the Americans, and he's very critical of, of what the president has been doing with the trade agreement with with the Chinese. You know, he wrote just some blur very uh, briefly, I think, on his Facebook page where he was saying that the Chinese and the trade deal got the got the better end, that they got the better outcome than the Americans and that it's translated and had their... Um, St- their their stock market is has gone up much higher than the than the New York Stock Exchange has as a result of the agreement, and he may be right, but the question is this: What are you? What are your core competencies? What can you work on today? What are the things that you can take off your plate that are going to enable you to develop the tools to deal with China? Because you know a lot of the things that he's been talking about, like the five G. My husband is a physicist, and so he understands this stuff a lot better than I do. And he said, "Look, the there's a lot of hype about." Chinese uh, fifth generation internet. It's not. It's not nearly ready, and it's not as good as people are making it out to be. But which is which is good to know. For instance, most people don't know that. I certainly didn't know that um, until he told me. And the thing is, is that you have to develop American technology. There are a lot of long term issues that the United States has to deal with, and in the meantime. You don't want to get bogged down with Iran having a nuclear weapon. You don't want to get bogged down with Turkey being empowered because you're you're sucking up to your enemy, Erdogan. You don't want to be bogged down with Putin either. I mean, you don't want to overthrow Putin. I mean, what does that mean even? Like, who's going to take over? Is it, oh, yeah, you know, George Washington is going to come riding in on his horse and they're going to take over Russia and turn it into America. Of course not. That's a lie. I mean, look what happened to them after the... Soviet demise, they brought in the KGB to run Russia. I mean, they like after a brief period with with Yeltsin, the drunk in charge, they brought in the KGB to take things over. So you're not talking about a country that has any liberal dem- democratic background whatsoever. So what do you do with Russia? What you do with Russia is you try to keep it away from you, mm-hmm. just like in the fiddler on the roof. May God keep bless and keep the czar far away from us. I mean, there's the same kind of concept with Russia. So what he's doing, for instance, with the gas pipeline to Germany is very smart. You know, decrease their ability to to subvert American interests inside of Europe. These are important things. America has core interests in Europe. Diminish your, Russia's opportunities there to harm America. If you overthrow the regime in Iran and another regime comes in and they want to make good ties, they want to develop good ties with Russia, fine, let them. You know, the the Americans should be there first, because then that keeps the Russians out of uh, out of Iran. You know, you, you the Americans have an interest in having a strategic alliance with the Iranians, just like Israel has an mm-hmm. interest in having a strategic alliance with the Iranians. The Russians aren't wrong to want to side with the Shiites against the Sunnis. It's just that America and Israel can't side with Iran today because the regime is their enemy. So if you overthrow the regime, the fact that Russia wants to have close ties with Iran is much less of a problem. So the point is there are things that you can do to diminish Russia's ability to threaten you. They don't necessarily involve confronting Putin. They involve diminishing his opportunity to subvert your interests and your allies. And I would say that, you know, like I said, I have criticism what he's doing in Turkey. I think it's a mistake. And I think that he should have a much colder relationship with Erdogan. I think Israel, for instance, has to be much more aggressive in in blocking the Turks' uh, inroads into the uh, Israeli Arab uh, uh, community that they've been funding and building mosques and schools. And particularly in Jerusalem, they've been doing this, but also in the Galilee. 
And I think that Israel has to throw them out. I mean, I think that there are things that have to be done, that can be done about Turkey's operations in Washington. These are things that the, the Americans can do to, to weaken an enemy. So one last player that's out there that we haven't spoken about, the Europeans. Where do you see them in this whole thing? Because there's NATO, and they really don't, they can't defend themselves, the Europeans. So where are they sitting in this whole thing with Iran? Well, the Europeans have been pro-Iran. I mean, Mm -hmm. they've been keeping the regime afloat, and they've been keeping the nuclear deal afloat, basically in collusion with with Obama, with the Democrats. They have been doing this. You know, Kerry's been operating really very treacherously an independent foreign policy towards the Europeans with Mogherini, who's now leaving, and apparently the person who's replacing her is just as bad, if not worse, in terms of anti-Americanism and anti-Semitism. But, I mean, this has been the way that they've been operating. But Merkel is about to leave Germany, and that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. And France is falling apart. So you have England, not where we were worried it would be a month ago. Which is amazing. Mm -hmm. And so the point is, here too, like, you know, Europe has always been a problem for the United States and obviously for the Jews. And, I mean, America is an, is a re, is a rejection of Europe. I mean, America was founded by people who rejected Europe. And it should just cling to that because the closer the United States becomes to Europe, the worse it is for America. And I think the British finally got that, you know, got that through their heads, which is why they voted, uh, the majority of the British people voted uh, for leaving the European Union. And then they brought in uh, 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 Boris Johnson Mm -hmm. to execute the withdrawal from the European Union. So that's a huge deal for America and for Israel. And by the way, I don't even think that Boris Johnson is that fantastic because, you know, when he was foreign minister under Theresa May, he operated a standard issue British foreign policy uh, towards Israel, which was which was hostile. So I'm not, you know, I bet he's better than Corbyn. He's better than Corbyn, and he's better than Patrice May, who's basically like the the British version of a deep stater. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, so he's in there now. It's a huge opportunity for the United States to weaken Europe, which is also important. You know, the the, the Americans regarding NATO and regarding the European Union had this default position in the post Cold War period that was um, uh, sort of nobody really thought about it like the default position of of nato of the united states on nato was to expand it eastward why well i don't know oh you know let's bring in ukraine what you know what are you talking about you think that the russians will ever let go of the ukraine like are you are you serious are you stupid i mean why why do you want to do that what strategic interest does it does it advance to bring in countries to an alliance that you will never go to war to, to, to protect? They're not important enough to you from a strategic perspective. Obviously, from a human perspective, boy, oh boy, that sucks. But you're not going to do anything about it. So why are you committing yourself to a war to protect countries that you will not protect? Because you're not thinking it, about it. You're saying, oh, we won the Cold War. Yeah, let's uh, gobble up the Warsaw Pact countries and bring them into NATO for no end. So that's what the Americans did. And some of it is fine. You know, you bring in the Poles. That's great. But, you know, if the Russians invade Poland, what is the United States going to do? The idea is to strengthen Poland so that the Russians won't want to invade it, which is a better thing. And that's more economic, I think, even. But having said that, so that's NATO. And there was also an even stupider American idea, which was, oh, the European Union is great. No, it's not. The European Union was an anti-American project from the very beginning. And so the idea that you want to empower the European Union is totally antithetical to American strategic interests because the European Union thinks that they can freeload off of the United States militarily and then oppose the United States as a bloc diplomatically. So what did the United States gain from having a European super state that's able to direct the foreign policies of the Poles and of, uh, of, of the Dutch and of, I mean, why would you want that? You know, you want to be able to work with like-minded countries or Hungary. Mm-hmm. Why would you? And because really, if you like, if you read Yoram Chazoni's book on nationalism, which is a really key contribution to the whole conceptualization and understand philosophically 
of of the European Union. I mean, it's basically a way to rebuild the German Empire, but do it through economic as opposed to military means. Because what is the central component of the European Union? What is the country that has been most empowered by the European Union? Well, it's them Germans. Mm -hmm. And as it works out, what we see the Germans refusing to outlaw Hezbollah, defending for dear life the nuclear deal with Iran, uh, voting against Israel, what, on 30 resolutions in the past month in the Europe, in the United Nations, and having just runaway anti-Semitism and paying tens of millions of dollars every year to fund these anti-Israel pressure groups both inside of Europe and throughout, inside of Israel and throughout mm-hmm. Europe, you see that they still hate us. That Germany is still Israel's enemy, no matter how nicely they talk to us when they're speaking to us face to face. And so why on earth would anybody support this? I mean, I remember one time I was talking to Sylvan Shalom when he was foreign minister because I had just attacked him bitterly uh, in a column because he said he wanted Israel to join the European Union. And I said to him, he, and then, you know, he said, oh, would you, why don't you come and meet with me? So, okay, obviously. He was foreign minister at the time, and uh, he said, I don't understand, why were you criticizing me? And I said, what is it that Europe didn't explain to you? They watered their grass with our blood. What is it that still hasn't congealed for you, coagulated? What, What don't you understand? What do they need to spell out? Their policies, the only foreign policy that they have is to oppose us at every level all of the time in a passive-aggressive economic and diplomatic war against the Jewish state. What is it that they have to clarify for you? They don't like us. They don't. They don't like Jews. They've never liked Jews. Not when it was because we killed Christ. Not when, you know, it was because uh, we're capitalists. Not because we were communists. They never liked us. Right. And now we're nationalist Jewish state when they're trying to erase all kinds of different identities. Yoram talks about that in his book as well. It's an important yeah. book. Yeah. Very important book. Point is, I said to him, what is it that you don't understand? And, you know, it's the same question that you have to pose to the Israeli left, right? Because basically what they're saying is we're post-nationalist. We, we don't like this whole national project for Israel. And therefore, we agree with the Europeans that there shouldn't be a Jewish state. Well... See, okay, that's problem, right? I mean, we can talk about it a little bit, but not too much because this isn't an issue that we're going to actually give any ground on. So if you don't like Israel, leave because there's nothing we can do about it. This is the Jewish state. It's a nation state. We're nationalists and and we want to preserve our nation. That's why we made, we came here. We didn't come here to be a, a, a post-nationalist state. We're surrounded by a billion Muslims. There's no non-Muslim country between Israel and India. Mm-hmm. So when you're... And if anti-Semitism gets worse around the world, which is something we won't even have time to discuss, we'll have to do it another time, we might have some people who need a little haven, which is, I hope not, but that's some, you know, that's where it's looking. Look, you and I both made Aliyah and we didn't need a haven. We came here because we're Jewish nationalists, because we believe in being part of the most extraordinary thing that the Jewish people have done since the destruction of the Second Temple. And we're very lucky and our children are blessed because we were we, we had the gumption to do it. But and everybody should do it. But uh, you know, the point is we like we like the Jewish state and, you know, people who don't want it, um, you know, we're not interested in having them subvert everything that the people have built here, thank God. And that's that. You know, so but the point is just to end, you know, what happened yesterday was that I woke up in the morning and I uh, and I got the news, you know, from my uh, trusty phone uh, that said that Suleimani had just been killed by the Americans. And I can't remember being so happy about a single event, uh, you know, aside from you know, getting married and having <laughs> your kids ever, because this was an extraordinary an extraordinary development it was pure good on every level there's no drawback to it 
Everybody says America is, you know, Iran is going to go to war with the United States. Iran has been at war, as my friend Michael Ledeen in Washington has pointed out, I think in every conversation I've had with him over the past 20 years. Iran has been at war with the United States since 1979. So it's not a matter of Iran will go to war. They have been hitting America and, of course, Israel with everything that they can since for 40 years, 41 years now. This is the 41st year. And... Uh, and it, and and the concept that there is an action that the United States can undertake that's going to change the nature of this regime is insane. What it can do is there an action, and America, God, thank God it, God bless America and President Donald Trump. They took it yesterday, and it is changing Iran, and Iran is changing, and they're giving a backwind to the people who are changing it for the better, because what comes after this regime is a question, but we know what we have with the regime, and it's a very bad devil that we know, and I'm sure that any devil that we don't know that may come up, and hopefully we won't get that, we'll get a great regime, but we don't know. We'll deal with that later. Right now, we're dealing with a regime that is satanic, that is on the verge of acquiring nuclear weapons, that has its talents that reach across the globe and attack American interests, Israeli interests, American people, Jewish people throughout the world. So, and it was run by Qasem Soleimani, and now he is dead. So the world is definitely a better place today than it was yesterday. And what comes out so clearly is what an ally and what an asset Israel is to the United States. If there's one country in the world, as little and gutsy as it is, it's the one that you and I live in. That's right. And Israel has no better friend than President Donald Trump. Carolyn Glick, thank you so much for your insight into a very interesting situation that I'm sure will only be developing in many different directions over the next few weeks. Take care, everybody. Eve Harrow Rejuvenation on the Land of Israel Network. Thanks to Tabitha. Thanks to Ben. Have a great week, everybody. Goodbye for now. This week on Inside Israel Today with Gil Hoffman, an exclusive interview with former Israeli ambassador to the U.S., Michael Oren, on the rash of anti-Semitic attacks in America. Those attacks on Jews in New York is not isolated incidents, but part of a national scourge that has to be confronted, and not just by putting policemen in front of synagogues. For the full interview, check out Inside